Hey, good morning, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'm um, welcome to the introduction to quantum mechanics short course uh, at High Performance Research Computing at Texas A&M University. Uh, my name is Lisa Bettis, and I'm uh, the Associate Director for Advanced Computing Enablement here and longtime computational chemist. Okay. So there are going to be six lectures. Each lecture will be about 40 minutes long, um, and then we'll take a short break, and then we'll resume with the hands-on session. Each of you should have received an email with login credentials to the Open On Demand portal um, that we will be using, uh, generously hosted by the Laboratory for Molecular Simulation here at Texas A&M University. Um, so as we're going along, I may be asking you some questions. I would really love feedback when I ask questions. If you go to the participants pop-up, there's a little thing on the bottom that shows participants. If you click on that, there's options to answer yes, no, go slower, go faster, and a few other options. Um, so before we get started, since we do have six lectures, um, I would like everybody to please go into the participants window and say yes. That I know how to answer in the participants window. It helps me to know that you're all out there. Um, it's very interesting giving the short courses over Zoom without being able to see everyone's faces, so I really need this feedback. Excellent. We also do have people that are um, watching the, the Zoom group chat, so if you have questions, you can post those questions in the chat. Um, and I will try to address them as quickly as possible. Okay, okay excellent. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so before I get started in quantum mechanics, um, I'd like to give an overview of microscopic and macroscopic just to show where we are going to be focusing I'm um, get this here in just a second. I can get my pointer set. There we go. So I would just like to um, show where we're going to be focusing for this short course. Okay, we're going to be all the way down here. We're going to be focusing on quantum mechanics where we have inclusion of electrons. So this is very, very microscopic scale. Okay, we're going to be dealing with the angstrom level. Okay, and essentially not really including time directly in these series of lectures in hands-on sessions. Um, that's a, a more advanced topic when you actually do something along the lines of quantum dynamics. Okay. So we'll be dealing at the angstrom level, and if you go up, then you can maybe, we'll talk a little bit about um, classical simulations where you can maybe move up to the nanometer scale, you know, looking at large proteins. Um, and then if you scale up further, further, you can do something with segments where you're talking about the meso scale, where you're no longer looking at the atoms directly, you're looking at some segments. And then going up further would be grids where you're at the continuum level where you can look at more of the, the macroscopic processes. Okay? And going from here all the way up to here is still an area of development. Um, there's a little bit of overlap, but it's very hard to go from here to here. But today we will be focusing all the way down at the angstrom level. So what are we talking about when we're talking about quantum mechanics? And I'm um, sorry, let me backtrack just a little bit. Um, the goal of these lectures and hands-on sessions is to give you an introduction of the topic, some of the mathematics behind it, and the caveats in those mathematics, the approximations that are made. Some of the more important um, concepts that you will run into problems with and when you try to apply it to your research. Okay, so that is the goal of this course. Um, I don't expect anybody to be able to go out and just run their research with quantum mechanics without additional support. Okay, so it really is an introduction. Okay, okay so what we're going to be doing with quantum mechanics is we're going to try to solve this thing called the time independent Schrodinger equation. Okay, and this is an eigenvalue problem. We have this Hamiltonian operator. It's going to be operating on this thing called a wave function. Okay, this is the eigenfunction. 
It's going to give us the energy of our system, okay, and then the wave function back again. Okay, so the goal of this course is to go over the forms of the Hamiltonian and the forms of the wave function that are used in traditional uh, quantum mechanics calculations on molecular systems. Okay, so the first thing that we should talk about are the major approximations that are made in the Hamiltonian. Number one is in the Hamiltonian for the vast majority of calculations, it neglects relativistic effects. We are going to incorporate relativistic effects in a different way using something called effective core potentials, which we'll talk about in lecture two. We're also going to be neglecting coupling of electronic states. Um, this is called the adiabatic approximation. And we will be neglecting the coupling of electronic and nuclear motion. This is the widely known Born-Oppenheimer approximation. Okay, so what does the Born-Oppenheimer approximation mean? Right, so we're going to be solving the electronic Schrodinger equation. We're going to completely decouple the nuclear and electron motion, and we're going to solve them parametrically. So since the electrons move substantially faster than the nuclei, we make the grand assumption that we can treat them somewhat independently as far as their motion. Okay, so we can split up the equation and we can just solve the electronic Schrodinger equation. So it's the electrons are seeing static nuclei, nuclei that aren't moving. Okay, in reality, they're coupled, but this approximation is generally okay. It's not always okay, but for the vast majority of calculations, it's okay. It is one of the major approximations that's made um, in the Hamiltonian for most molecular quantum calculations. Okay. So we've completely decoupled them, and we solve them parametrically. Okay, so the first thing that we need to do to get started in performing quantum calculations is you need to have molecular coordinates. Okay, all of the molecular coordinates, including the hydrogens. Um, and I've seen this over and over and over again. People will start with their calculations and they'll go get a structure or they'll draw something and they won't have all the hydrogens in place or um, they will have a catalytic reaction, they throw some stuff in there and want to do calculations on it. You have to have intimate knowledge of the atomic coordinates for your molecules if you want to do molecular quantum calculations. Okay, so you have to have a good starting structure, reasonable, coordinates for all of the atoms, including the hydrogens, okay? You can provide these coordinates in many different ways, Cartesian coordinates, internal coordinates, Z-matrix, internal redundant coordinates. There's a long laundry list that you can usually provide, but you have to know the element and where it is in space, okay, relative to each other and all of the elements involved. So this is an example of ethane, right? We have C2H6. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about symmetry. This has D3D symmetry. Um, you should know if your molecule has symmetry. This has an impact on the calculation, which we'll talk about more. You're also going to need to know the overall charge of your molecular system. Okay, so for this one, the overall charge is zero. So a lot of people will automatically want to assign charges to each individual atom. Okay, in the quantum world, the electrons, they're shared. Each element may hold a larger percentage of that electron, but the electrons are shared. So we don't assign charges to the atoms. We give an overall charge, which is the electron count for the system. Okay. The other thing that you need to know is the multiplicity, okay? the number of unpaired electrons. So in this case, our multiplicity is one because we have no unpaired electrons. And we'll get to the definition of multiplicity at the end of this first lecture.
Okay, so getting started with the atomic coordinates. Like I said, you need to have you have to know all of the elements, where the hydrogens are, where everything is in space. Um, but you also need a good starting structure. So if you don't have a good starting structure, you will end up either having something called an SCF convergence failure, um, or you will optimize to an excited state or some other high energy structure that's not pertinent to the um, chemical system that you're interested in. Okay, so where you get your reasonable starting structure really depends. If you have a crystal structure, that's a good place to start. However, lots of crystal structures have disorder, okay, which means that they have atoms that are either in multiple locations because they, they have two occupancies and you have to clean that structure up. Um, the other issue with the crystal structures are the hydrogens. Addition of hydrogens to crystal structures sometimes is not correct, okay, or poorly done, or they're left off completely. Okay, so you have to clean up all of that um, to provide to the calculation. Okay, so here's just an illustration of a reasonably good starting structure, and this is a bad starting structure. Now you'll notice there are bonds drawn, right? When it comes to quantum calculations, you can draw bonds all day long, it means nothing. Okay, it means absolutely nothing because it's going to optimize the wave function which is going to localize the electrons. It cares nothing about what you draw for bonds. It only cares about where this atom is relative to this one, what the distance is, what the angle is, okay? Because it's the proximity of this atom to this atom that lets it develop the atomic molecular orbitals and optimize the wave function, okay? So even though I have, you know, a double bond drawn here and a double bond drawn here, this is a bad structure because this distance is unreasonable and it's not gonna be able to optimize a wave function or if it does, it's going to be a very bad wave function, okay? So you really need a good starting structure. If you don't have a crystal structure, there may be a similar crystal structure that you can start from and then modify it with your favorite drawing program. There's a ton of them out there. Okay, so you can find your favorite drawing program and draw it in there, okay? And it takes a little bit of getting used to um, and it really depends on the type of system that you're going to be investigating. Okay, so this is my general overview after you have your molecular system, um, then you have to decide about a level of theory. Okay, the level of theory will determine the Hamiltonian that's going to be used for the Schrodinger equation. So remember, we're doing our time independent Schrodinger equation and we have this Hamiltonian. Okay, the level of theory determines the form of the Hamiltonian. There's a lot of them that are out there, Hartree-Fock, molder plesset series, density functional theory, couple cluster, and more. Okay. Um, so which one you choose, it really depends. Um, usually literature is the best place to start to see if somebody has already investigated your system type and determine what level of theory is best for it. Sometimes your choice of level theory also goes to computational cost. Um, what can you afford to calculate? Okay, and we'll talk more about that later also. Okay. Then you also have to choose something called a basis set. So the basis set is going to determine the mathematical form of the wave function that you're going to be using in this time independent Schrodinger equation. Okay, so level of theory goes to the Hamiltonian, basis set goes to the wave function. There's a lot of different basis sets out there. This is gonna be a linear combination of atomic orbitals, and we're gonna discuss this more during the second lecture. Um, it's the coefficients and exponents for the functions that are used to define the atomic orbitals, which get combined together to make the molecular orbitals. Okay, you'll see a lot of acronyms, the Popol style basis set, Stuttgart. There's a long list of basis sets. Again, how do you choose one? Literature is always a good place to start. And more importantly, calibration. Okay. So you can do calculations, and you can do calculations, and you can do lots of calculations, but because there are substantial approximations that are made in these levels of theory, you need to calibrate, okay? One, often you don't even know um, if the molecule that you're calculating is truly the molecule of interest. 
Okay, so you need to have generally some experimental data to calibrate against, whether that be a crystal structure, um, if you have some rate information, UV vis, um, there's a lot of different experimental data that you can use to calibrate against. Um, you can also calibrate against what are called benchmark calculations, which are very high level calculations. So often what you do is you run uh, lower level calculations on a bigger system, and then you might prune it down, run it again on that low level, and then run it on the high level calculation and see if you're getting consistent results. And that's how people are often calibrating against benchmark high level calculations. Um, I believe that we're gonna get to the, the benchmark level calculations um, on day two or might be day three. I can double check that. Okay. Okay, so the general when you're getting started, I said you need a good starting structure. If you don't have a good starting structure, you're probably going to end up getting something called SCF convergence failure. Okay. So the vast majority of these calculations will optimize the wave function that we're going to be solving for by doing a self-consistent procedure. And that's what's illustrated here in this flowchart, okay? This iterative process, it's called SCF, okay? It's solving a set of nonlinear equations, right? So the first thing that it has to do is obtain an initial guess for this thing called C. This C is your coefficient matrix. This is the coefficient that is part of the basis set that goes to the atomic orbitals. So if you have a really bad starting structure, it's going to have a really hard time um, assigning a reasonable initial guess for the coefficient matrix. So if it can't assign a good coefficient matrix, then it's going to fail when it goes through this iterative process. It's not going to be able to optimize the wave function. Okay, so we're gonna revisit what each of these steps means, but I wanted to illustrate that it's an iterative process and your starting geometry is critical for getting a good initial guess, which is critical for optimizing the wave function, okay? So it goes through this process of optimizing the wave function. Once it gets the wave function optimized, then it will go through and do a geometry step. And then the wave function, and then the geometry. And this also goes to the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, where we have decoupled the electron and nuclear motion. So here we're optimizing the electronic part, and here we update the nuclear coordinates. And then the wave function, and then the nuclear coordinates, okay? So as we're updating the nuclear coordinates, I'd like to point out if you're going to be optimizing the geometry of your molecule, your starting structure is critical not just for getting a good wave function and getting the wave function to converge, but also where you're gonna end up on the potential energy surface, okay? So this is just a schematic representation of something called a potential energy surface. When you're performing a geometry optimization, if you start with a molecule that has a geometry that is somewhere like this on the potential energy surface, you're gonna fall into this local minimum. If you start here, you'll fall into this one. If you start here, you'll fall into this one. So you can, if you have a big floppy molecule, when you perform a geometry optimization, just a standard geometry optimization, it's not going to sample conformational space. It is not going to move the ligands around substantially and look for lower energy minima. It's only going to optimize to the closest minimum of your starting structure. Okay, which may or may not be the confirmation or structure that's important for your experimental results. Okay, so you need to keep in mind that it's only going to optimize to the closest minimum and it's not going to sample different confirmations for you. 
There are other procedures if you want to sample conformational space, um, but a standard optimization does not do that. Okay, so does your molecule have symmetry? Symmetry is very useful for quantum calculations because it can decrease your computational cost. Okay, these calculations are computationally intensive. So that means they, they use a lot of memory, it uses a lot of CPU, um, and they run for a long time. Okay? If your molecule has symmetry, it can decrease the amount of computing that it has to do. For each symmetry element, it has the computational cost. So it is beneficial to use symmetry, but you need to be careful because if you have symmetry imposed, which is not the correct symmetry, most likely it's going to maintain that symmetry and you're gonna get the wrong result, okay? So here's my simple ethane example. We have something called D3D symmetry for the staggered conformation, and we have D3H for the eclipsed conformation. So if you're performing a geometry optimization for this, and my movie is not working, so let me, I'm gonna exit for a second. Oops. Yeah, it won't work when I'm doing the laser. Okay, so when I'm playing this, that's how much change there is in the optimization. This is a geometry optimization. It's my starting structure, that's my ending structure. Okay, so there's not a substantial change. Okay, if I go to the D3H, okay, again, there's not a substantial change. Okay, so let me ask um, those in the audience, are both of these minimums? Are both the D3D and the D3H stable species, intermediates? Are they minimum? I'll give just a minute for everybody to think about that. Okay, so the staggered conformation for ethane is the stable species. It's an intermediate or reactant, okay? This is a transition state. This is a high energy point on the potential energy surface. So if I'm doing a geometry optimization that's supposed to optimize to a minimum, if I come back to here, geometry optimization standard should go to a minimum. Why didn't I get a minimum with this one? It's because I impose symmetry, okay? So this is where the danger can come in if you impose the wrong kind of symmetry. Now this can also be helpful when you're trying to calculate a transition state, um, the high energy point on the potential energy surface for a reaction, okay? But you need to be aware of symmetry that's imposed for the system. I think there's a question in the audience. How can you tell? We are going to get to that. So the question was, how can you tell if something is an intermediate or if it's a transition state? Um, so if you don't have a, a chemistry background, there's something called a frequency calculation, which we're gonna cover, I think, in a couple of slides, um, that will tell you whether or not it's an intermediate or a transition state, okay? So the point on this slide is that symmetry is very useful, decreases your computational cost, but you need to be aware as to whether you impose symmetry and you need to double check to make sure whether or not you've optimized to a minimum or some higher order saddle point. If you do not have a background in, um, in symmetry for molecular species, this is a very nice online tutorial. Okay, so there was, there was a question that the hydrogens are much closer to the opposite hydrogen. Yes, they're in the eclipsed form, not where they wanna be. Okay, this is staggered, they're further away. And we can also ask more questions and, and go over some of these things during the hands-on session. Okay. So I'm gonna be throwing a lot of information at you that's why there are six lectures. 
and this is just the, the, the getting going. Okay, so this is the slide that goes over more about the, the stationary points. Okay. So I talked about the minima on that fictitious potential energy surface. Okay, so this is another representation of a potential energy surface okay, in three dimensions, where we have a minimum here, and we have a minimum here. And for the reaction to go from one minimum to another, you go over this point right here, which is the transition state. Okay. So to determine what kind of point you've optimized to, um, you can do a frequency calculation. The frequency calculation will give you the vibrational modes. And if you look at the vibrational modes, if they're all real, you're at a minimum. If you have one imaginary mode, then you're at something called a first order saddle point, um, which is a transition state in transition state theory. If you have more than one imaginary mode, you're at some higher order saddle point um, that is generally not on the reaction path. There are some specialized things where you have bifurcations, radical reactions that do all sorts of fun and interesting things that don't fall into the standard transition state theory. They're outside of standard transition state theory. Okay, so this is for standard transition state theory, which is what most of the reactions that people are investigating computationally fall under. Okay. Okay, so this is an illustration of the eclipsed form where we have the, the D3H. This is the imaginary mode. It's the imaginary frequency and it has that twisting motion that connects the two minima. So whenever you calculate these, you always want to look at the imaginary mode to make sure that it is consistent with um, the transition state that you're expecting to find. If it is not consistent, I always suggest that you critically think about what it is consistent with instead of just throwing it away. Because sometimes you will find an important transition state that is not in line with what you were thinking, but very important to the research that you're doing. Okay, Just like if you're doing something experimental and you get odd results or results that you weren't expecting, you should think about what those results mean because they may be very important to the research that you're trying to perform. Okay, so this is a first order saddle point, right? So here's the person sitting on the saddle. That's why they call it a saddle point because it looks like a saddle. Uh, let me go back to my laser pointer. Okay, so um, one of the things that I mentioned on the, the symmetry slide was that you need to be careful to determine whether or not you have symmetry imposed for your system because it may not optimize to a minimum, it may optimize to a higher order saddle point, okay? But that can be beneficial. If you have a different point group, a different symmetry for your molecule from the reactant to the transition state to the product, it makes it a lot easier to calculate transition states on the reaction chemistry. So there was a question on the previous slide as to what these coordinates mean. So there's really no, um, this would usually be some kind of a, a coordinate like a, a bond distance or an angle, okay? Two different maybe coordinates on this one, um, bond or angle, two bonds, something along those lines. Um, this one here would be energy. So this is definitely energy. Um, so I should label that one energy, but this is a fictitious, you know, um, two coordinates that would be consistent with this change in reaction. Okay. So this is a schematic. Okay, so as I mentioned, it could be um, very beneficial to have symmetry to find transition states if the point group changes. So this is just a standard SN2 reaction. Um, so here we have C3V symmetry. We have a 
three planes of symmetry, and we have multiple rotation axes. So like I said, if, if you're not familiar with point groups and symmetry, that one webpage that I listed is a really nice tutorial. You'll probably want to go look at that if you're going to be doing calculations with molecules um, that have symmetry in them. Um, so if you have a difference, then you can just do a standard geometry optimization on your reactant in C3V symmetry, and then you can do a standard geometry optimization in D3H um, for the transition state that is shown here. Okay. So the wedges here, this is coming out of the plane, and this is going back into the plane. Okay, coming forward, going back. And then these are in the plane, since there is no wedge on it. So for D3H, symmetry, this is a minimum, but in C3V, it's a transition state, okay? Or in no symmetry, it's a transition state. Okay, so that's why you can do a standard geometry optimization. It makes it a lot easier to find these transition states. And we are going to be doing during the hands-on sessions um, calculations for optimizing to transition states. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about geometry optimization, and we talked a little bit about frequency calculations. The frequency calculations calculate those vibrational modes. Okay, and I showed you the vibrational mode for the imaginary mode of the ethane twisting, right, at the transition state. So eclipsed ethane, the imaginary mode was the twisting motion about the carbon-carbon bond. So one of the things, that was listed there was that it was an imaginary frequency. In most programs, when you have an imaginary frequency, it puts a negative sign in front of it, which flags it as imaginary. The reason it's an imaginary mode is the frequency is the change in the energy, okay, divided by some constant and taking the square root of it. At that point right here, Okay, at the transition state, this vibrational mode will take it down in energy, right? So at that mode, it's going to take it down in energy, which means that the difference in energy at that transition state for that vibrational mode is negative. And if you take the square root of a negative number, you get an imaginary mode. So that's why in first order transition state theory, the transition state has one imaginary mode. It's one vibration that takes it down in energy that connects the two minima on either side of it. Okay, so when you read in the literature that the transition state has one imaginary mode or the reactant has all real frequencies, that's what they're talking about. That's how you characterize whether or not it's a minimum on the energy surface or a first order saddle point, which is a transition state. Okay, so for the vast majority of these quantum calculations, um, molecular systems, the frequency calculation is using a harmonic approximation. Okay, so the harmonic approximation, which is shown here, it's to first order. Okay. In reality, the vibrational well for molecules is more Morse-like where you have something that is asymmetric. So what this means for your calculation is the higher you go in the vibrations, the larger the error will be. Okay, so as you move up in the vibrations, the error will get larger and larger. Okay, okay so what I also wanna point out here is when you're doing a geometry optimization, you're calculating the energy all the way at the bottom of this well. So you have not included even, it's not even the energy at zero K. You're all the way below zero K. It's, it's a non-realistic number, okay? This is the electronic energy for the system. It's not even the energy at zero K. To get the energy at zero K, you need to do a frequency calculation because you need to get the verse vibrational level, and that will get you the energy at zero K. Okay. And then it can also populate the vibrational levels. Um, so you can get the thermal corrections that you can get up to the enthalpy. Okay. 
Okay, you can get the energy at 298 and the enthalpy under standard conditions and then the free energy under standard conditions. But if you do a standard geometry optimization, you're only getting the electronic energy. It optimizes on the electronic energy surface and that is a consequence of the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. It's the frequency calculation that's required to get the energy at 0K, the energy at the first vibrational level, okay, and the enthalpy and free energy under standard conditions. Okay, so here's a standard output from a Gaussian calculation um, and the information it'll provide. Okay. So this is for HCN. Um, we have the reactant, we have the product, and this is our transition state. Where you have the hydrogen moving back and forth between the carbon and the nitrogen. So this is our first order saddle point. Okay. Now remember, this is within the harmonic approximation. It lists all of the frequencies. So it lists all the frequencies. Here is our imaginary mode. Okay, the first vibration should be tagged with a minus sign so that we have an imaginary mode. And then all of the other frequencies going up are real. They don't have the minus sign on them. Okay. And you can look at all of these different frequencies and see what kind of mode they have. So this is just a three atom molecule. Um, so we have very few frequencies here. And then down here, it will actually give you the, oops, sorry. It will give you the um, energy at zero K, the enthalpy under standard conditions and the free energy under standard conditions. Okay, so when it does a geometry optimization, not sure if you remember, but we had two iterative processes. Okay, we had a wave function iteration, okay, to optimize the wave function, and then we also had a geometry optimization iterative process. Okay, and these are both self consistent. It looks at the last step and compares it and decides whether or not it's converged. So if you do a geometry optimization and then a frequency calculation, it's going to give you a listing of maximum force, root mean square and force, maximum displacement, and root mean square and displacement. And this is in regards to the movement of the atoms from one geometry step to another and the forces on it. Okay. So there is a value that it's achieved and then there's a threshold and then it's whether or not you've achieved that um, falling under that threshold that is imposed. If you get all four yeses, that means that it thinks that it has reached the bottom of the well for a minimum or the top of the point for a first order saddle point. Okay. If you don't have all four yeses, it's actually not uncommon if you have a very flexible molecule that your forces converge, but your displacement does not, okay? And that is a consequence of a very, very small force can cause a large displacement. Okay. So you want to see four yeses, but it's not uncommon to get two no's and two yeses. Okay. It will tell you if it's reached the optimization, give you the frequencies and of course the energies. Okay, a little bit about the energies, the thermodynamics. Um, one of the consequences of using the harmonic approximation to first order, the harmonic approximation to first order, right, is that you need to be at a stationary point to get good thermodynamics. If you're not at a stationary point, if you're not at a minimum or a first order saddle point, the potential well is very anharmonic and your thermodynamics are not going to be accurate. Okay. So when you're looking at energetics from these molecular calculations using quantum mechanics, you need to take them at the stationary points. Otherwise you're going to get 
anomalies and poorer quality results. Okay. So if you want to learn more about um, the thermodynamics from these calculations, there's a white paper on Gaussian's webpage that you can go through. Okay. And it's just emphasizing that the structure needs to be a minimum or a saddle point to get accurate thermodynamics. And that's because we're only looking at the harmonic term. So here is just an illustration if you're looking at scanning a bond distance. Okay, so we're no longer at the minimum or the transition state. We're scanning along the bond distance. Okay, so we start here and this is the electronic energy and the electronic energy is nice and smooth. Okay, remember the electronic energy is all the way at the bottom of that potential well. It's not even at zero K. So now I've done a frequency calculation at each one of these points along scanning this bond distance, increasing the distance, doing a single point calculation to get the energetics. Okay. So here it is at zero K. This is at the first vibrational level. And you start to see a little bit of an anomaly in the energy. So you know, this one, the electronic energy is nice and smooth. But as you go to zero K, you start to see some bumps. Now, if you go to the free energy, you start to see a lot of bumpiness. Okay. Now, what I want to point out here is this energy is in heart trees. Right? There are 627 kcals per mole per heart tree. So this bump is a lot of energy. This is not a small bump in energy in kcals. This looks like a small bump in heart trees, but this is a pretty large deviation um, in kcals. And the reason for this anomaly is because we're not at a stationary point. And that's why the free energy and the enthalpy will also have those variations if you're not at a stationary point. Okay, so these types of calculations within the Born-Oppenheimer approximation are meant to get energetics at the stationary points, okay, not in between. So if you are interested in reaction chemistry, then um, you can calculate the reactants, the transition state, and the products. If you're um, not 100% sure that the transition state is the one that you're looking for, you can do this thing called an intrinsic, intrinsic reaction coordinate calculation, where you give it information about the transition state, and it tries to follow the imaginary mode to the reactant and the product. Okay. Um, so we will be doing that, or that's an optional um, uh, calculation that you can do in the, the hands-on session. Um, okay, so we have our molecule. We have a basic understanding of, you know, we're optimizing the wave function, optimizing the geometry. The other information that you need to give it that I mentioned was the, the charge, the spin, or multiplicity, okay? So you need to know the overall charge of your system. I, that really should say charge of the system, not molecule. Because if you have more than one molecule in your calculation, which normally you try to avoid, but if you do, you need to give the overall charge of the system, okay? Not of the individual atoms or species in the molecule. Okay? And then you also need to give the spin state. How many unpaired electrons do you have? So for Gaussian, you provide it as spin multiplicity, which is two times the overall spin plus one, okay? Where S is the total spin. Okay, so S is just the sum of the M sub S's. The M sub S value is plus one half for spin up electrons and minus one half for spin down electrons. So if you have just as many spin ups as you have spin downs, then your overall S value is zero. Two times zero plus one gives you one. Okay, so if you have no unpaired electrons, your overall S is zero, your spin multiplicity is one and it's called a singlet. If you have one unpaired electron, your spin is one half and your spin multiplicity is two, it's called a doublet, okay? So this is where this terminology comes from, singlet, doublet, triplet, refers to the spin multiplicity, okay? And if you have a triplet, you have two unpaired electrons. They're usually assigned as the alpha. So you have M sub S one half plus one half that gives you an overall spin of one, okay? If you do not know how many unpaired electrons you have in your system, um, you can try to glean something experimentally, or you can calculate different multi 
multiple spin states and compare the energetics of those. Okay, so I always like to point this one out. Molecular oxygen is a radical. It has two unpaired electrons. Okay. Why does it have two unpaired electrons? Well, if you look at the molecular orbital diagram for molecular oxygen, we have these two molecular orbitals that are these two pi star, where you have antibonding between the p orbitals, okay, antibonding because we have out of phase. This is one phase, that's another phase. So we end up with a node in between and they're the same energy. The electrons have the same charge. They'd like to get away from each other. So if you have two orbitals that are the same energy, they will split up. Okay. So we end up with two unpaired electrons in molecular oxygen. Singlet molecular oxygen is very high energy and reacts with everything. It's triplet molecular oxygen that we have floating around for the most part in our atmosphere. Okay. So we have a multiplicity of three. So I, I have a story where somebody went through and did all of their calculations with singlet molecular oxygen until they found out that that was wrong and had to go back and do them all with triplet molecular oxygen. Okay, so just because it's a organic or whatever you think, I'm um, double check to make sure that you have the right charge and multiplicity of your system or at least sample and check um, different multiplicities. Um, the other um, uh, idea that a lot of people have about, about the calculations is that if it's a small molecule, it will be easy. And that is not true. Um, most very small, highly symmetric molecules tend to be really hard to get good results for okay? because they have a lot of symmetry and a lot of quantum effects. So they will be faster to calculate because they're small. So you will get the wrong answer faster uh, with the small molecules. Okay, so small molecules are not easy. They're just not as computationally intensive at the lower levels of theory, but they usually require higher levels of theory to get accurate. Uh, molecular oxygen reaction calculations are quite difficult to get accurate. Okay? There's a lot of this stuff called multi-reference character that we'll get to in, in one of the, the future lectures, okay? <laughs> Okay, so small molecule does not mean easy. All right, so this is our last slide. I know we're running a little bit over. Um, and then we'll take a short break and then we'll have the hands-on session. Okay, so something called restricted versus unrestricted calculations. Um, so you know the overall charge of your system and you also have to know the spin state. Okay. If your spin state, if you're doing a singlet where you have no unpaired electrons, you're gonna be doing something called a restricted calculation. Okay, and that's what's shown here. Where you have your spin up electrons and your spin down electrons, okay? These two are in the same character molecular orbital. Okay. These two are in the same character molecular orbital. Okay, so this is called a restricted calculation. If you have unpaired electrons, this would be called a restricted open shell calculation, where these are in the same character molecular orbital and you have one electron left over. This is generally not what you do with open shell calculations. With an open shell calculation, by default, you'll be doing an unrestricted calculation. And what that means is that the character of this molecular orbital will not be identical to this one, but they'll be similar. Okay, it allows for spin polarization which is a more realistic description of what the electrons see. Because if you have a spin up and a spin down, um, and you have more spin up than spin down, this electron is gonna see something a little different than this electron. Okay, so this electron will see something a little different than this electron. Um, so it allows for spin polarization, okay? But they should be similar in character and not completely different. Now, a lot of people, when they have unpaired electrons, will think that the highest energy alpha occupied orbital will contain the singly occupied molecular, or will be the singly occupied molecular orbital. And that's true sometimes, but more often than not, it looks something more like this, where the singly occupied molecular orbital is actually lower in energy than the doubly occupied, okay? So this molecular orbital only has a single electron in it, and there's a higher energy orbital that has a spin up and a matching spin down. Okay. 
So if you're interested in doing an open shell calculation where you have unpaired electrons and you want to know the character of the molecular orbital that has the unpaired electron, then you need to not just look at the highest energy one, you need to find which one doesn't have a matching beta electron. Okay, and we're gonna go through that during one of the hands-on also. The other thing that you want to watch out for is something called spin contamination. Okay. So if you have unpaired electrons and you're doing an unrestricted calculation, you should get this or this, but what you might end up with is this where you have two spin-ups and a spin-down. And this spin-down doesn't match either of those spin-ups. So what you really have is three unpaired electrons, two spin-up and one down. And you can often catch this by looking at the um, S-squared value. So the S-squared value is just the total spin um, times the total spin plus one. So for one unpaired electron, a perfect S squared value is 0 0.75. If you have an unrestricted calculation, it should be close to that, 0 0.76, 0 0.77, 0 0.7, something along those lines. Okay. If you end up with something that's halfway between a one unpaired electron and three unpaired electrons, like a 1.56, perfect one unpaired is 0 0.75, and perfect three is 3.75, that's an indication that you have spin contamination, okay? which might be hinting that the higher spin state is lower in energy, or that your geometry is more in line with a higher spin state. Okay, so those are things that you would have to investigate if you had an S squared value that was not in line with the number of unpaired electrons that you should be having. Okay, so in summary, to get started with calculations. Ah, okay, so there was a question of um, what's the reason to calculate the S squared value? Um, calculating the S squared value gives you an idea of the purity of your spin state. If you truly have the number of unpaired electrons that you asked for. Okay, why is the S squared value equal to S times S plus one? That goes to quantum theory and is really beyond the scope of the current lecture today. Um, so you would have to go um, and explore that in physical chemistry, okay? And uh, quantum chemistry. Okay. So for the scope of today's lecture, when you do these calculations with unpaired electrons, it will give you the S squared value and you want to look at it to make sure that it is reasonable. Okay, so as a, a general overview of um, what we covered in the lecture today, um, you need to have your, a good starting geometry. You need to know what elements you have and where they are in space and a good starting geometry. You have to choose a level theory and basis set, okay, which we're gonna go over more as to what those things are. Um, you need to know the overall charge of your system, okay, and you need to know how many unpaired electrons you have. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and take um, a five minute break. And when we come back, um, we'll get logged into the, the Vidi portal and get started. I'll give an overview of the hands-on session that you're going to be doing. And it's, it's mostly just uh, getting introduced to how to set up and run these calculations and how to look at the results, okay? Okay, so five minute break. And we will return at uh, 11, we'll return at 11.05 uh, Central Time. Okay, let's go ahead and um, get started for the hands-on session. Um, so hopefully everyone has either been able to log into the video portal at some point um, before the class, the short course. Um, if not, let's go ahead and, and log in now. I see quite a few of you on. Let's get everybody else logged into the Vidi portal. So if you just go to, if I can push that just a little. Yeah. Vidiportal.chem.tam.edu. You should have received login credentials for this short course via email and a link to some instructional videos. 
So before we get started, let's get a response to see how many people have been able to log into the open on demand portal. I'm on Vidi. And if you haven't, go ahead and click no so we can get you set up. <laughs> Okay, um, so we have a couple of people that were not able to log into the portal. If you could please send me a direct chat as to what problem you ran into, then we can try to troubleshoot that. Okay, um, passwords are case sensitive. It should work on any modern browser. Unfortunately, Safari is not one of them though. And it gives you a warning. So this does not use your TAMU ID. It uses the login credentials that you were emailed. So it should be training with some number after it and then the, the password that you were sent. You're not using your TAMU credentials. Okay, so... <clears throat> It's going to be um, pretty hard to use this on an iPad. I have actually used the open on demand portal from my iPhone, but I don't suggest it. Um, and you would need to get Chrome, not Safari. Um, you cannot use Safari for it. Um, I have done it in the past on my iPhone with uh, Chrome and Firefox, but like I said, I, I would not suggest it. I, I can't help you troubleshoot that one. Okay, so hopefully everybody's at least at this point. Um, when you get to this point, when you're logged in, uh, you just come up here to the interactive apps, right? Okay. The default is probably 12 hours when you log in, unless you've changed it. You have an option from one to 12 hours, and we're gonna be using two core um, for this class. So this is just gonna give you a desktop on one of the compute nodes, okay? And then you click launch. And then it says, please be patient as your job currently sits in the queue. Now, I will say that if you fired up multiple desktops, you can only run one at a time. Okay. Um, so there's a question in the chat that I will get to in just a minute. All right, so once you get to this, I want to point out these two options. If your network connection is a little bit slow, um, you might want to increase your compression and decrease the image quality, okay? But if you do increase the compression, it's gonna use more resources on your computer, so you may need to close other tabs or maybe some other programs to free up memory and CPU. Okay. I'm actually going to increase my image quality just a little bit so that I'm it'll be clearer for the remote participants and see how that goes. Okay, and then I'm gonna launch my desktop. So you can have a desktop here, which will make it very easy and fast to run graphical programs. And this goes to the question that was posted in chat. This is, it looks like this VM, um, this is not a virtual machine, by the way. This is bare metal. Um, it's using Turbo, something like Turbo VNC. And if you wanted to, you could try to do something like that. But since these are training accounts, you can't SSH in. You can only get in through the open on-demand portal today. Okay. Um, so the question goes to whether or not, why are we using the open on-demand portal as opposed to using some other method um, for getting a, a login or remote graphics? The open on-demand portal bundles everything for you, okay? gives you a full desktop, gives you graphics. Um, and 
sends the information efficiently over the network. And, and that's why we utilize the open on demand portal for these training courses and on our um, production uh, high performance systems. Okay. okay, so here we are. I now have a full desktop. Um, can everybody see their desktop? Go ahead and let me know yes or no. So you should have a day one, day two, day three, and some reference material. So we are in day one. And if you open that up, you'll see a copy of the lecture slides. Um, and you will also see these HS1, HS2 files. And these are the hands-on sessions that we're going to be going through um, until about 12 o'clock, okay? Um, the other thing that I wanna point out here is the reference material. Um, these are overviews. There's a, an intro QM um, for the short course. It goes over Gaussian and Gauss view. Gauss view is the graphical interface that we'll be using for quite a few things. Um, it also goes over basic input structure for Gaussian. And then there's a kind of a short synopsis of some different ways that you can, um, methods that you can use to try to calculate transition states, which we'll use later. Um, but these two are, are nice reference material on um, the uh, graphical interface, Gauss view, and um, for Gaussian in general and its setup, including the input structure. So everything that we're covering for uh, running these calculations in Gaussian, um, you can apply to other pieces of software. They just have different functionality, like what Gaussian includes for all the levels of theory and methods is not necessarily included in other pieces of software. Other pieces of quantum software may have some other specialty calculations that are not included in Gaussian, okay? But the general premise is the same. So once you learn one piece of software, you can usually translate it to use another. Now, um, Gaussian is licensed software. Uh, Texas a and University does have a site license that allows for um, the researchers at Texas A&M College Station to use, but it is licensed through the Laboratory for Molecular Simulation, so it requires a subscription to the LMS. Okay. Um, we are not allowed to um, let people outside the university that are not at College Station use it for their research. We can use it for training. Um, so that's what we're doing today. Same thing with GaussView. GaussView is licensed software. You have to purchase it for use. Um, but it is one of the more heavily pieces of pieces of software for quantum calculations that's used uh, worldwide. Okay? And that's because I always like to say it is the most user-friendly um, piece of software for quantum calculations. And when people have never used anything else and they start using Gaussian, they think, how can this be user considered user-friendly until they go try to use another piece of quantum software? And then they will understand it is generally considered the most user-friendly quantum code out there for molecular calculations. Okay, um, so let's go ahead and get straight to it. Let me go ahead and open this up. Maximize it. Let's see if I can zoom in a little bit more. View and control plus plus. Now I will say one thing about the portal is copy and paste is a little bit different. Um, you cannot directly copy and paste from your computer into the portal unless you use an intermediate clipboard. Okay. So don't be surprised if you try to copy and paste um, from your computer to the, the portal and it doesn't work. Okay, so this is the, the hands-on exercise that we're going to be going through. Um, it, it gives you an overview of exactly what to do um, basically, what you're going to be doing is manually setting up an input file for Gaussian um, to run a simple calculation and then look at the results by referring to the reference material um, that has been provided in that one folder on your desktop. Okay, so let me go through some of these, these basics. Um, it talks about first opening a local terminal. You can do that through the menu options. Okay, you can go to Applications, System Tools and there's a, a terminal option, you should get something that looks like this. Okay. Or, let me minimize this real quick, you can also just right click on the desktop okay, and open terminal, and then you will get your terminal. 
So why don't everybody try to do that right now? Go ahead and open your terminal. And if you have your terminal open, please give me some feedback with a yes. Good. Okay, so the terminal is where you're gonna type in your commands. Without this terminal, without this prompt, you can't type in any commands. Okay, so the prompt is waiting for you to type in commands to do things. Okay, the vast majority of what we're doing will be in the terminal, right? All right, now you'll notice when you open your terminal, it gives you some instructions. It says to set up your environment for the introduction to quantum mechanics short course, please use the following module command. So what we're gonna do is load this module, module load QMSC. Okay, and it says that it's inactivating the environment for Gaussian, Gauss view, and Molden. Okay, and then it gives you a bunch of important commands or useful commands. Okay, so this module has been set up specifically for this class to set up your environment for you to run everything that you need to run. If you were going to be doing this on another system, okay, a very multi-user system, which is generally where you're running these types of calculations, you need to find out how to set up your environment to run the calculations. Okay, on the HPRC systems and the vast majority of multi-user HPC systems, it's using some kind of module. The module, all it does is it loads a bunch of settings to set up your environment for what you need to run. Okay, so for today, we're going to be using just module load QMSC. Okay, so once that's loaded, then we have everything we need. So let me go ahead and get back to this one. All right, now you'll notice that I have here training pound at node name. Okay, this pound should be replaced with a number. Okay, in this example, it's training 99. And the node name is compute 0-0-25. Okay, node is just the... the compute node that you're on. So there's a, a head node and then there's a whole bunch of different compute nodes. And the open on demand portal is shooting you off to one of those computers um, in the HPC cluster um, that is available for your desktop, okay? You can have more than one terminal open at a time, but note that if you open another terminal, you have to load the module again to set up your environment. All right, so prepare your environment by typing. I skipped the module purge, which was bad of me. Module purge cleans your environment and then module load QMSC. So if you would like to do that, go ahead to make sure that you have a clean environment. And then for text editing, we're gonna use a program called nedit, nedit, and then you can give it a file name. So somebody had a question that says that they are unable to open the document. Um, can you tell me what you mean by that? Um, you double click and it won't let you open or you can't see it? Okay, um, so one of the things I forgot to mention Why don't you go ahead and try the suggestion um, about restarting your desktop. If that doesn't fix it, then I'm, we'll go ahead and, and get that fixed in just a minute. Okay, okay so the text editor that we're gonna be using is called nedit. You can type nedit space capital hs1.com and that will just open a file for you for editing. And then you're going to be putting in this text. Now, if you copy and paste this in, you're gonna to have to get rid of all the special characters. Okay, so what I'm gonna do right now is, is don't worry about um, opening the document. Excellent, I'm glad they said that worked. Okay, so if you have trouble opening the document, the, the fix is in the chat window. Okay, I'm just gonna walk through what these lines mean. So this is a, an input file for a Gaussian calculation. The vast majority of these programs um, you provide it with an input file that has instructions and often a bunch of other files, okay? So for Gaussian, the first line here is this percent CHK equals, and this is a, oops, a path, this slash home slash training, 
you need to replace this pound with a number that goes to your username. So training 76, training 12, whatever your username is, okay? And then desktop, and then the checkpoint file name. This is where Gaussian is going to create this thing called a checkpoint file. Again, with most intensive calculations, it will save a often binary file that has important information about the calculation. So intermediate information, starting information, final information. And that way, if the calculation gets interrupted, you can restart the calculation or read in the results for further processing. And that's why they call it a checkpoint file because it's a checkpoint along the line of the calculation, okay? All right, so this is gonna tell it where to save the checkpoint file and what to call it, okay? And if you're not familiar with Linux, just kind of roll over this, um, but it will be something that you'll want to become familiar with in the future if you want to do these types of calculations. Okay, so this is the path to that checkpoint file. Okay, and then this is called the route line. The route line tells Gaussian what type of calculation to do and what information is in the input file. So it starts with a pound. This one you keep. This is your standard pound, okay? You put a P after it, a space. This is level of theory. This is basis set, which I know we haven't really talked about in detail. We'll get to that more. Right now it's just learning sort of the, the procedure of setting up and running a calculation, okay? And then OPT is to perform an optimization, FRAQs for a frequency. This is for printing. It will print the coefficients and exponents of the basis set for record. And then this will print the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of the wave function, okay? So these are directives that you give to Gaussian on what to do. And then you need a blank line to end the route section. Gaussian is pretty much set up so that you terminate sections, the vast majority of the sections by blank lines. Okay, so the number and location of blank lines is critical. If you have too many blank lines in one place, it'll crash. If you don't have enough blank lines in one place, it'll crash, okay? Okay, and then you can put in a title. Generally, you wanna stay away from special characters, but the title is just information for you. The calculation doesn't use it, but it gets printed to the log file, okay? So if you wanna have something like, you know, finding a transition state for ethane, um, that could be your title. Blank line closes the title section. And then this is the charge and multiplicity. So our overall charge is zero, okay? And our multiplicity is one, so we have no unpaired electrons. So here we have the coordinates for the molecule of interest. So we're just doing formaldehyde here. So we have carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and hydrogen, okay? The oxygen is attached to atom one for a distance of B1. Hydrogen is attached to atom one for a distance of B2, makes an angle with two for A1. Okay, so these are internal coordinates. Okay, so this is all relative to this carbon. Now I mentioned you can give the coordinates in all sorts of different fashions. Um, it doesn't have to be this format, this Z matrix. You can give it Cartesian coordinates, but that's what we're gonna use in this example is the Z matrix. That other instructional um, handout that I gave that goes over input also talks about different ways of providing the coordinates. Then you have a blank line to close out the Z matrix. And then you have the actual distances that go with these variables up here, B1, B2. Okay, so there was a comment in the chat that you couldn't log in with your NetID and password. Um, that is because this is not using NetID um, for your username and password. It is the login credentials that were emailed to you. It should be training with a number after it and the password that was emailed to you. Okay, um, and then you have a blank line at the end. Now, everybody at some point is going to miss the blank line at the end. This is just inevitable, everybody does it. And in your output file, you will get end of file while reading, blah, 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 something or another. And that's because the blank line at the end is missing, right? And then you can save and exit that file, okay? And then there's more details about that here. Okay, so this section down here goes over the actual nuclear coordinates and Z matrix. This is what I was, was saying um, when I walked through this. So it goes through in detail what all of these things mean. 
And like I said, you can use Cartesian coordinates also, but you have to get your coordinates from somewhere. I am providing you the coordinates today. Okay, so then um, I go through and it says, you know, please see the Gaussian 16 input file format handout for details, um, how to read these things, and additional information. So once you have your input file, you can save and exit, you get back to your prompt, and then we're gonna submit this calculation to the queuing system. Now I provided a little script, a little script. it's called QPrep. Um, so if you're familiar with Bash, this is a little Bash script. Um, that's a, a scripting language um, that's available in Linux. It just goes through and you pass it the input file and it sets up something called a job file for you. Okay. And we're gonna go through this more um, in the, the next hands-on session. Okay, what, what's in the job file and what it's doing. But right now it's just, let's just get through the process so you can get an introduction to setting it up and running these calculations. Okay, so if you type QPrep space and then your file name.com, Linux is case sensitive. So please type everything in exactly as you see it. Okay. Um, then it will submit it to the queuing system. And then you can watch the results of the calculation by typing in this command this tail space dash F space capital HS one dot log enter. And it will look at the lines as they're appearing as the calculation is running. Okay. Once you see normal termination of Gaussian 16, then you can control C out of this tail command. Control C at the, the prompt, the command line is not copy, it's a hard interrupt. But that's how you get out of the tail dash F command, okay? Okay, so now that your calculation is complete, um, then we're going to use uh, Gauss View and Molden to visualize the results. Molden is free, okay? So your account's been set up with that and it runs on everything if you work hard enough. It runs on Linux, easy, uh, Mac, reasonably easy, Windows, a little bit less easy, okay? But you can, you can install it on everything. Um, so if you type Molden space hs1.log, um, you will see this pop-up, okay? I suggest that if this is not turned on to please turn on this sticky bit. And then I want you to just go ahead and play around with the settings that are in the mold and control. Okay. And, and we'll go over this, I'm probably at about 11.50. Um, I'll walk through uh, the results of all of this, okay? Okay, so I give you instructions on how to look at the results, clicking on distance, visualizing the change in the geometry. And then I walk you through, I'm looking at vibrational modes, the spectrum, okay. And then we're gonna shift gears and go from Molden to Gauss View. And you can look at the results with Gauss View, okay. Um, so it talks about the difference between them, okay. And visualizing different aspects of the results of the calculation, including the molecular orbitals, okay. And looking at the vibrational modes. So like I said, the vast majority of this assignment is just to get you familiar with an input file, submitting it to the queuing system and using the graphical programs to visualize some results. Not to understand what you set up and what levels of theory and basis that you used and or any, any of those things. It's, it's more of just getting introduced to the software and the environment, okay? Okay, so at this point, um, I wanna go ahead and stop recording. Um, and I want everyone to try to walk through this hands-on session, okay? And if you run into problems, then I want you to put information in chat. You can either send it directly to me um, or you can pose the questions to everyone, okay? And then at 11.50, I'm gonna go ahead and walk through. Um, all of the steps that I just talked about to show you what it should look like, okay? Okay, um, so some of you may have gotten through a fair bit. I'm setting up, submitting calculations. Some of you may have gotten stuck, that's okay. 
Uh, right now, what we're going to do is I just want to go through the steps that I verbally walked you through um, earlier. And then you can continue to work on this, um, or we can revisit it during the, the afternoon session. Okay? Okay, um, so I've typed in the input file that I gave you in the hands-on um, session one tutorial. So I have my percent check line. You'll notice that I have these, you know, the spaces and the blank lines instead of the special characters. And then one thing I want to point out is that is not a blank line at the end. So if your cursor ends here and there's, there's nothing else below it, that's not a blank line. That is a blank line. Okay, it needs the enter at the end. Okay, so I have my file now. The other thing I want to point out is if you'll notice here at my prompt, I've got my end edit here and my cursor's down here. If I try to type in a command here, nothing's going to happen. And that's because end edit is running interactively. For me to get my prompt back, I have to close and edit, okay? So I'm gonna save my file and I'm going to exit. And you'll notice that it caught up with my command. Okay, so if you type in a command at the prompt and it doesn't respond, don't keep typing in commands. Try to figure out why it's not responding before you keep typing in commands because it'll try to catch up if it can. Okay, so I now have my file here. Now, one thing you might notice is sometimes files will appear here automatically and sometimes they won't. Okay, so don't be surprised if you've created a file on your desktop and it doesn't automatically appear. Um, sometimes they won't with the graphical, but you can always see them command line with the ls. Okay, so I type ls to list my files. There's my hs1.com. And now I'm going to go ahead and submit that to the queuing system. So I type qprep, it's my file name. It says, do I want to submit the job? Yes, I do. And now I've submitted the job. Okay, and it shows my jobs that are running in the queuing system. So I have two of them. One of them is my dashboard. Okay, make this these. Okay, so one of them is my dashboard with the open on demand portal and the other one is my job running, going to be running in the queue. Right now it says that it's waiting. Okay, so if I type SQ, dash u and my username, okay, it'll update the information. Now my job is already out of the queue, okay? It's no longer listed, I only have my dashboard. But just to show you what it looks like, do tail dash f and then my output file. So the input file was hs1.com, right? And then I also mentioned something about an hs1.chk. That's the binary output file, right, that the, the program reads. And then the human readable one is the hs1.log. Okay. So if the calculation was still running, more information would be popping up as it was running. Okay. But right now, since the calculation is not running, all I see is the end, which is the normal termination of Gaussian 16. Okay. So this is a good sign. This means Gaussian thinks that it's finished normally. That doesn't mean you got the right answer or that you got what you were expecting. That just means Gaussian thinks that it finished normally. So I'm gonna type control C. You'll notice that it shows up here, okay? So it brings me back to my prompt. All right, so now I'm gonna use Molden to look at this result. So Molden is a little bit clunky, but it has a lot of unique features that are quite useful. So here's the control panel. Um, now, it looks like I don't have a molecule, but I do. And that's just because it was looking straight down and it was on stick. So if I change it to solid, you can see it better. I'm gonna click Geom Convert. What this is showing me is the energy change at each geometry optimization step. So here's my first one. You'll notice it starts with the starting structure. The second one and the change in energy in Hartree's. Okay, so there's a big change in energy and then it levels off. It took five geometry optimization steps to finish. And then I can also click movie and it will show me the change in the geometry, which was not substantial. Okay. Okay, so you can also look at the normal modes. Here's my spectra, right? 
I can click on the different vibrational modes and it will tell me or show me what they look like. Okay, and you can change the scaling factor to make them bigger. I can close that and that. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and put it back to the stick for a moment. To do the distance, you have to click on two atoms. And it's very picky about where you click. Okay, so it says click on two atoms. If you don't click right at the center of the element, it's not gonna take it. Okay, so since I was able to click right on the center, then this pops up, it gives me the distance and I can click monitor and it will show up here. Now, if you click movie, it'll, it'll show you the, the change in the structure. Let me bring that back forward. So if I go to the first point, it'll tell me the distance. And if I click next, it'll update the distance and how it changed when I was doing the optimization. Okay, so you can go ahead and play with different things in, in Molden. Um, now, the way that you get out of Molden is you can't close the window. It'll complain. It says, use the skull icon to quit Molden. You have to use the little skull and crossbones right here, and then you can click Molden. Okay. So now let's look at the results with Gauss View. Now this is one of the nice things that I like about Linux is instead of having to load the program and then say file open, you can just usually say the program name, okay, and then the file that you want to open, it will automatically open it. So you can just type gb space capital hs1.log and it will open the log file. Okay. You have to wait for this to go away. All right, so here's my molecule. Now one of the main differences that you might notice right away is with Molden it loads the starting structure, the structure that you drew and gave the program in the input file. Okay. Gauss view by default loads the final geometry and only the final geometry. Okay, so that's a major difference between the way Gauss view and Molden works. It's a very important difference because if you pull up Molden and you only look at the structure it shows you, that's the unoptimized geometry. It's the geometry that you provided not the final result. Gauss view shows you the final result if you load the, the log file, okay? Okay, so you can also look at the vibrations in here under results, and you can go to vibrations, okay? If you wanna see the spectra, you can pull up the spectra, it gives you the IR, and in this case, it gave us the Raman because we did a hartree fock calculation. We'll go over that in one of the, the lectures, upcoming lectures. Um, you can also click on the, the vibrations in here, okay, to get the, the values on which one is which, okay, and their intensities, okay. And you can change the properties of this. So if you go to properties, you can change the, you can broaden it, okay. And you can zoom in on parts, insert access, you can do titles, and you can download this information. So you can save the data and then import it into Excel. So there's lots of functionality in there. Like I said, this is um, licensed software though. You have to have a license for it. Okay, so if I wanna see the vibrations, I just click start animation and it will show me the animations. I can also do show displacement vector. I can make them bigger, make them smaller. Okay, I'm, oops, not that one. You can change the displacement amplitude. You can make it really, really accentuated. It's kind of fun to watch. This is the best part of the calculations, is watching the animations. Okay. okay, and you can also do a manual displacement where you can push it along the vibration. Now, the, the more accentuated you get, I'm, the, the more, I figure out the way to say this. So the more you push it from its original structure at that vibration, um, the less realistic the position of the atom is for the vibration, okay? So it helps our eye to be able to accentuate the vibrational mode so we can see what the motion is. Um, but as you make the displacement bigger and bigger and bigger, the less realistic the location of the atom is, okay? Okay, so. All right, that's enough for vibrations. Uh, oops, let me put it back to 
the way that it was. Yes, good. Okay. All right, if you want to view orbitals. They moved it. I always forget. Uh, tools. So you go into the tools menu and molecular orbitals and you get this not to scale molecular orbital diagram. Okay, so this means there's two electrons in here. Now, if you do this from the log file, your visualization tab is not available. Okay, and that's because it requires the checkpoint file to visualize orbitals. So if you want to visualize orbitals, you have to load the checkpoint file. If you've already loaded the log file, as long as the checkpoint file is in the same place, it gives you the option. When you go to the new Gaussian MOs, you can just click load, okay? Or you can file open and load the checkpoint file. Okay, now my visualize tab is available. This ISO value is the value of the wave function that it's going to plot in space to make the surface. Okay. I generally like to use 0 0.04 or 0 0.05. I'm gonna go ahead and change it to 0 0.04. So this is my highest occupied molecular orbital and this is my lowest unoccupied and I'm gonna say update. So click on update. Okay. And here are my molecular orbitals. So this is my unoccupied, there's no electrons in this one. And this is my highest occupied molecular orbital. Okay. And you can right click and change the way things view. I'll let you go ahead and play around with that. If you wanna view more of them, you just have to highlight them and click update. Now, historically, gauss hue has had a history of crashing while visualizing molecular orbitals. So if you plot a whole bunch of them, um, I would not try to touch it or do anything until this comes back, okay? Uh, otherwise, you increase your risk of it crashing. <laughs> okay, so that's why you can go through and look at your molecular orbitals. All right, so if you are interested in visualizing some of the other surfaces, you can come in here and um, look at under the results, surfaces and contours. Okay. Yeah. So for this part, it's not gonna know that the checkpoint file exists. So the only way for you to do the surfaces and contours from this menu is if you load the checkpoint file. Okay. So what we're gonna do is go ahead and exit, and I'm going to load the checkpoint file. Okay. If you do not have a checkpoint file, it's because your calculation either didn't run or your percent check line in your input file was not correct, and your checkpoint file is not where you think it is or it got lost, one or the other, okay? So now that I have my checkpoint file open, I can do my results, surfaces contour, cube action, new cube. Instead of doing a molecular orbital, I'm gonna do total density and click okay. And now I have a cube for that. I generally turn on add new views, and now I want a new surface. And here is my density, okay? With a surface that has an ISO value of 0 0.0004. Okay, now what I wanna do is I want a new cube and I want to do electrostatic potential. So now I have electrostatic potential, okay? And I need to select that one, okay? And I want this one selected and I want new mapped surface. No, I did that backwards. Sorry. I need the density selected and surface action, new map surface, and I'm mapping the electrostatic potential on the density. Okay, so let me do that one more time. Select the density, surface action, new map surface, the cube available, you need the electrostatic potential, and then you click OK. And here is where you get the nice, pretty electrostatic potential, where we have an electronegative region where the red is and the electropositive region. We're gonna talk more about what this means, um, but this is the, the protocol that you go through to visualize these types of results. If instead of getting this, you get some weird hyperbolic surface with colors on it, you've plotted it backwards. You've plotted the density on the electrostatic potential. Okay? Okay.
So that goes through um, what that assignment does. Um, we are at time to take a break for the afternoon and we will resume with a lecture at two o'clock. Um, and then after the two o'clock lecture, we will have the second hands-on session. You are more than welcome to proceed with the hands-on session one tutorial. Um, there was a note that there was a part where you generate a video for the vibration and it asked to install a tool. Um, so that probably will happen to everybody. So you'll not be able to, at this point, um, generate a movie of the vibrational mode, but I'll see if I can get that fixed over the break. Okay, okay. I will stop recording, but I will stay online um, for questions, okay?